Welcome to La Taverna Friuli Wines, the definitive podcast on wines from Friuli Venezia Giulia. I'm your host, Wayne Young. Hey, okay, we're here. Oh, I'm going to start pinging people in. Sorry we're late, everybody. I'm trying to see if we can get some people to come on. I'm going to start pulling. Ah, Ghislaine, there you are. Very good, very good. Sorry we're late, everybody. Thank you for being patient. Um, just getting some things set up here. So please um, give us a moment while we get settled. We're all here. Let's see, uh, there we have. It's this. Secondo te? No. So, no, it's you. It's Nat. Oh, okay. All right. Stefan, how are we doing? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be pinging people in here. Sorry, everybody, if you're, uh, if you're here and you're waiting, but we're gonna get to Paul right away. So, and thank you for your patience. So, hang on just a second. I'm gonna start inviting you all up on stage because that's the way I want you. All right, there we go. Hi, Gislaine, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. I was waiting to uh, for yeah, this room. Yeah, sorry, I was a little bit late <laughs> there, but yes, doesn't I'm, matter. We're, doesn't matter. We're but gonna have, get going now. Yeah, I have to leave in half an hour, so. <laughs> but um, hopefully, yeah, Paul will be uh, well, Paul, in there before. Paul is a super. No, Paul is here. He's a super okay. interesting guy. And mm -hmm. um, so definitely jump in, Ghislaine, if you have questions. Hopefully the room will start populating. I've been pinging people in. So hopefully some folks will be on their way in as soon as possible. So, yeah, this is what I'm hoping. Oh, so Paul is with you in the same room? Yes, Paul is with me in the same room. Yeah, we have a whole okay. – we literally have a Taverna mm -hmm. studio with, like, pro mics and the whole deal. I mean, I'm, I'm going okay. all in on this whole thing. Yeah. If you check out the, um, the page on Facebook – you mm -hmm. will see uh, some pictures of us here in the in the, the taverna. Okay, okay, I will do so. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, I'm yeah. still pinging people in. So hopefully, people will start coming in soon. Okay, Heather's here. Fantastic. Hi, Heather. How you doing? Come on up and speak if you like. But um, so I'm going to get started because we are a little bit late. So um, as always, we have the lovely Natalie Benlolo joining us this evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm fine this evening. How are you? Good. I'm doing just fine. Good. Are you excited about meeting Paul and learning about the wines of the Northern Adriatic? I have been doing my a little bit of research, so oh, I am very interested in what you've got to say and your beautiful book. Well, you know, definitely jump in. You got a question, Nat, cool. and um, that goes for everybody who's listening too. Hopefully, the room will populate out a little bit. We've only got a few listeners here, but. We're going to get started. So um, we also got Robbie. Robbie, thank you for being here. You're always the best. Paul, what a wonderful, uh, it's been a long time since I've seen you. It's been probably since um, the end of last year, maybe, um, when we saw each other at Moschioni. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a long time ago. It was in January, but long time, too it was, long. Yeah, too, long. too long, too long, too long. Well, welcome back to Friuli. Thank you. Um, Paul, um, why don't you... Introduce yourself. Tell us where you're obviously not Italian. I am from the Netherlands, originally. The ne okay. And so you speak, obviously, English perfectly, thank goodness. That's all, in my <laughs> uh, way. Yes. And, and now you live in Piemonte? I live in Piemonte, Italy, since okay. 12 years. Since For 12 years, okay. Yes. And um, what brought you to Italy? Uh, Italy is my favorite country. It, it hits me directly when I started to drive around, meet people, and uh, find the, um, uh, the, the, the total uh, together uh, of, of the, f the fine people with their Italian humor, which I like very much, then the, the fantastic wines, the fantastic hospitality, the gastronomy, the, everything which you find in this country is so fascinating that I was... Too much fascinated to to stay along too so i decided to live here okay so uh, and 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 you've been in piemonte for 12 years not continuously okay 
because I travel. Because you're you're kind of a, a Renaissance man. You, I mean, you're you're a writer. You're a musician. I mean, you're you're a published musician. You you have CDs of your music. You're a piano player. Yes. And and you're a wine expert and a wine writer. And and we've worked together with with um, we've worked together with. Uh, 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 bloggers and things like that. So um, you have such a well-rounded experience in the world, you know, and traveling around. So um, so obviously you, you, you first fell in love with Piemonte, but then you embarked on this project after you, your, because your Piemonte book is actually beautiful as well. Thank you. Um, you embarked on this project for the wines of the Northern Adriatic, which you published both in English and in Italian. Yes. Which is amazing. Um, how long ago did that happen, and what um, what moved you to to work on this project, the wines of the northern? Well, Italy? you can tell that it took me almost ten years to make this book happen. Wow! And there have been many moments when I was desperate, and I thought, well, it's never going to happen because it's too complicated. It'll never. But it happened. We <laughs> made it, so and, I'm and really it's happy. Here we yes. have it in our hands. Yes. Um, the reason is that. After doing northwest of Italy, which is fascinating, um, I uh, thought you can do Tuscany or you can do Marca, but I thought this area is so fascinating. I wanted to do this area. Um, and then when you drive around in Friuli, every time when you speak with producers and we speak with people and you read something, you understand that this territory has a very specific history that goes back to Austria and Venice and uh, all the times when there was no border and uh, when all these territories had also some something together. There was sometimes here a border or there was there a border, but it was very often there was also no border. So I understood that you can only understand and explain the wines if you explain them together. So that is how this book was uh, created. And you can also see the map here in this book, it has various territories and you see the natural territory, the physical territory, the mountains and the sea, and you see no state borders. That's the way it should be with wine. With wine, yes. Yeah. Because this is the way the wines of this region should be understood. And that's what I am going to say. So this was your concept was sort of to sort of bring this a whole sort of macro area together. Yes. Into one. Ba so, what are what are some of the characteristics that unite this these these different regions? Because once you start talking about okay, Berda and Colio, it's basically the same region. Yes, you know? um, it is. And and Colio Orientale and Colio, basically the same. In fact, Colio Orientale is in, in some ways also a, a continuous uh, flow of the hills of Colio exactly. and Berda. Um, similar soil. Similar soil. Yes. Exactly. In fact, you, you can look at this map and you can make a long straight line and you see along this line a long stretch of flesh soils which for several hundred kilometers goes down. And where where does it go down to? It, like down it, to it, like It Rijeka. goes down to Novi Vinodolski. Wow. The the same flesh soils that you find above Civitale del Friuli and up here near Novi Vinodolski. So it's a where, long sort of vein uh, of this. I was this two stuff. days ago there and there also there you can find very, Same soil. very uh, um, similar soils mm -hmm. and also very interesting wines. Wow. Um, and Vipava Valley also is yes. part of that same yes. Yes. sort it's of... A, a, it's, it's a straight line. It's a straight line. Yeah. Wow, that's really amazing. Uh, and so how... It, and then so the, if I could say one thing that, that is a little bit confusing for me is how do you get Istria into that group? Because I can um, see... Colio Berda, Colio Orientale, Vipava, even, you know, Grave a little bit. But yeah. once you start getting into down into Istria, how do you... It's easy. It's easy. It's okay. easy to understand. You have to understand the history of the region because this region was one province in the Roman Empire. It was called the province of Istria at Venezia. Ah, um, it was called Histria and Venezia. It was the 10th province of the uh, Roman Empire. Uh, Caesar was very important here. He founded the town of Civitale del Friuli. Yep. 
Um, and he went down with his troops until Pula, and later they constructed more roads. This territory had so many um, things together. Later, during the Ducato di Aquileia, which was the basis of the region of Friuli, um, still all this territory was united, which means, for example, in the early Middle Ages, uh, there were mon monasteries created in the area around uh, Udine, uh, Rosazzo, and south near the coast, but also in um, Istria and, and down, and they communicated together, they communicated their wines and their grapes, and they talked about wines. So one wisdom in that period was in the hands of the church, uh, the church, sorry. The church, okay. And um, this area was was just one area. Wow, it's like okay. That. The so Abbazia di Rosazzo in 1200 had vineyards in Istria. No, that's true. And also the all, Abbazia, all of yards, all of, all of, all of, all in all of, Istria. Yes. Now that I didn't know. Yes. And even though I read your book, I must have obviously forgotten that fact. Uh, I, it is mentioned. It's I'm sure it yes, is. It's it a, is. But wow, that's really amazing. So yes. it started with the Roman Empire, yeah. and then it was moved over to the church, and the church sort of connected this yes. entire region. You also can say that the general history of the region is already clear. It was uh, all connected. But this also means that uh, not only the general history of the region is connected, but also the wines are connected. Because uh, in the past, f uh, it was very funny to see that when they had to bring wines from Porridge to Aquileia, at a certain moment, they had to pay taxes to Venice because the Venice, uh, they were dominant on the, on the, on the border, on the, on the, the area of Istia. Yeah. So the, only the, the, the wine did never see Venice. But can you imagine, you bring wines from Istria to Aquileia, and they have to pay tax to Venice. Can you imagine? It okay. was it was just one example of how they were going in sometimes. In the book, you also find um, a particular detail about a diplomatic incident between Austria and Venice. I call it wine diplomacy because it's it's also um, traded by the diplomacy, and it it shows uh, it's in maybe in, ch in chapter three uh, at page. Uh, 26, mm -hmm. you find how the, the the influences of Venice were very important and the, uh, the the Venetians were so clever, they even sold wine to Austria and to Vienna. I remember but reading in the book that, that basically the Habsburgs found uh, the wines from Collio and Collio Orientale and Berda, obviamente at that time it was the same area, to be the best wines even for your health and yes, or things like yes. that. This area was for Austria the most important wine region. Um, it was the, 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 the Omega, the, the, the most important region. So um, for Austria it was uh, especially important because they, they wanted to, to have their wines and to, to save their wines for the market of, of uh, Vienna. So the wines from Collio did not have to pay ta taxes and could go easily to Vienna. The wines from Venice that should pay taxes, they went through Klagenfurt, they went probably via the old mountain road along um, what is now Pinzano and the uh, Tagliamento and then uh, through the Alps to Vienna, and they had to pay taxes. And um, it, it, it shows that for Austria, for the old Habsburg Empire, because Austria is a recent uh, terminology, Okay. Um, Habsburg uh, was very important, uh, very dedicated to these wines, and they wanted to protect them, and they wanted to protect their interest. Okay, and you have also to understand that in the, the let's say the 15th and the 16th century and until the 17th, uh, a term like Colio did not exist. Of course, um, it was the area of Gorizia. They talked about the area of Gorizia, and in in Vienna they said we have now the the great wines from Gorizia, and they mentioned the wines from the hill area, which is now Colio Berda and uh, part of uh, Colio Italy, okay. also part of um, Vipava, Vipava and Isonzo, was still called the the area of Gorizia. Okay. In that time, they did not have specific denominations. Oh, okay. So, so this is something that you know Roman times, church times. Habsburg Empire, really, really interesting. Way, yeah. Heather, did you have a question? Okay, so, uh, no, this is really, no, I had somebody, I thought somebody was going to ask a question, so sorry about that. Um, so what's the, what's the effect on the wines? Um, 
so so we have we have a lot of sort of shared varieties. Yes. Something like Ribola Jala or or Refosco, which or you Mal, find Malvasia. or Malvasia, yeah, which you find everywhere. Yes. Right. Um, so as far as sort of a, a a profile, as far as the wines are concerned, what's the common denominator there? Uh, first of all, I think that uh, there is uh, a common thing in the wines, and that is that you. Um, can find something of the the special soils and the climate character in the wines, and um, it doesn't mean if it uh, matter of they are from uh, the Slovenian or Italian uh, Colio or Colio Orientali or the western part of Ipava. Those areas there is some common sp- aspect which you find in all wines. Uh, it is something like the special minerality. The, the something in the uh, taste that you never will find in any wine from France or any, anywhere. It is typical for here. Typical for this area, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, how, how much research, how many wineries did you visit? How many places, how many people did you talk to? It must have been... In, thousands. Uh, thousands, thousands, over 10 years. Yes. To, to put this book together, so so much uh, information in, into into one book. Nat, did you have any questions for Paul? I don't want to monopolize the conversation. At the moment, I'm just listening and learning, and I think it's interesting how you explain that three countries, one terroir is what you were saying. Yes. Three countries, one. Yeah. I'm just listening. There's a, you've obviously a, um, a wealth of information and knowledge, and yes. and I'm learning all the time. So. Yes, you know um, about uh, the the territory. Uh, what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to bin, bring forward, is something that is also very ambitious, and maybe it has not been done before. Um, that's to say to the world, this territory which you see in the map in this book is in fact something like Burgundy or Tuscany. Or Piemonte or Bordeaux. It in, is in relative terms of size. Is it similar to size to those areas? Uh, it's the most small one. It's the smallest it's one. So m- Bordeaux is bigger yes, than uh, the northern Adriatic. Uh, in I have made an espina- estimation of the total uh, vine surface, vineyard surface of this area. It might be thirty-two or thirty-three thousand hectares. Okay. Maybe a little bit more. It's not. It's not very easy to make such an estimation. Uh, Bordeaux is about uh, 111,000. Wow. Uh, Burgundy still is above 50,000. Uh, Piemonte about 44, 45,000. Tuscany, I don't know exactly, but certainly much more. So um, this is uh, uh, in total surface, it's mm-hmm. smaller. But um, the difference is that uh, the differences inside in character of soils are very different. But that does not matter. You can say in English language, this is one terroir. Okay. I have verified this with also the best speakers of English in the English wine world, okay. who are great experts of wine, but also of language. And uh, you can say this is one terroir. It's possible, even if the soils in Istria and in Karst are and in, in the Graaf and Corio are different. Well, there, there are yes. other terroirs that have different soils. Obviously. Yes, uh, you split them up by, by yes. vineyard or hillside or whatever. Because the term term terroir is more uh, about the the togetherness of uh, soils, climate, wine regions, uh, with culture and history together. In okay. that sense, this area can be considered one area. It is an umbrella term because Bordeaux is an umbrella term. Um, uh, Tuscan is an umbrella term. The people who listen cannot see that I'm making the make form of an umbrella with my hands. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. But um, it's just uh, the in- Italian way of doing it. Paul, I have a question. Go ahead, man. Is it controversial what you're saying? Have you come up against any controversy by calling it one terroir? Has anybody said uh, just... Well, the first thing you have to know that sometimes people uh, understand the word terroir in different ways. That happens uh, because sometimes they understand it only as soil and it's much more than only soil. So don't uh, mix up uh, the word terroir with only soil. It's not that. Um, so um, uh, it's very important to understand that you can include in the word terroir a lot of things. Uh, that, that is one. 
Um, and I have just recently started uh, the promotion, and due to COVID, it's going uh, a bit slowly. So uh, I cannot say that I have met um, controversial. No, uh, sometimes somebody says, "Hey, you have Istria in this book uh, together with Collio. How is it possible?" Well, my answer is very easy. Um, once. Uh, I think three or four hundred years ago, the town of Trieste was very important wine region. No, it's not. But they had uh, huge vineyards. What they did when the town expanded, the, the, the commercials and the wine people from Trieste, they went into Istria, planted vineyards with the same varieties that they had near Trieste and they made wines in Istria. The same thing they did also in Collio. So what happened? In that period, they produced for at least 200 years, a wine in Collio, which was in that time one territory not divided into two countries. Into two countries, right. Uh, in Collio, and that wine was called Prosec. Ah, okay. Prosec was a wine from Collio in the past, but it was also a wine from Istria in the past, and it was also a wine from Trieste in the past. But it was not a wine from one grape. It right. was a still wine because they had no technology about sparkling. Spark like, yeah. um, and it was a wine of probably five or ten different varieties. And we can only guess which were the varieties. I can do a guess if you want, but I I cannot prove it. And so for that reason, it makes sense that it's called terroir. That, that, we, can, mm, that we can use the word terroir to talk about, if you're talking about Prosec that comes from all these different places. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Wayne, are you with me? Um, I, mm. Keep you're, going. You're saying that Prosec was the name given to a wine that covered a large area, even though it had lots of different varieties. Yes. Doesn't that, by definition, make it terroir? Well, the, war, the, the word terroir should be understood as a cultural word. word. Uh, it has, has uh, a wide meaning. A very uh, big meaning, yes. yes. Uh, it, it includes not only the soil or one territory, it includes the complete um, together of all uh, aspects of the culture of that territory. And in this case, it includes, yes, Collio, but also the Karst, also uh, Istria, uh, also the, the Grave and the Plains region of the flat region of Friuli, and also the Kvarna. Um, and uh, in fact, I was talking about Prozac just to give an example of why the area of Istria and Collio are related, because the, the, the culture in both territories were developed both by Trieste. Wow. So is Prosec related to Prosecco, the town near... Yes, the town Prosecco near, near Trieste yeah. was called uh, Prosecco in Italian language. Uh, Italian language or uh, Slovenian language in that time, in the past, were going uh, side by side. They were equal, of equal importance. Uh, the local people uh, normally talked uh, Slovenian and the commercial language was Italian. There was a count, an Austrian count, Prosec, and you wrote it with GK in the end of the words. GK. GK, Count okay. of Prosec. He was controlling the roads around the village. Huh. And he also controlled the wines, of course, because that's part of the count in that period. And um, uh, the, the wine of that area caught the, the name Prosec because of that. Okay. And now it's a completely different thing. Well, in some way, um, the, the grape that produced most of the, the, the grape variety that produces the highest amount of grapes is taken as the, the central variety for Prosecco today. Which is Glera. Which is Glera. Which but wasn't called Glera back then. Uh, was it called uh, Well, Glera? I think it was called Glera. By the oh, okay. But you have to understand that uh, it's, it's not completely clear. Because when we look at the monuments of the 16th centuries and earlier, Sometimes they don't even indicate um, uh, grape varieties. So you have to guess which grape varieties they were working with. Okay. We only can guess by doing some research in our archaeological uh, places, etc. Um, the only thing is that it's, it's quite clear that grapes like Glera, uh, Malvasia, Vitovska, uh, Ribola Jala have been created in this area. Okay, so they, they were born here. They were born here. Um, in the case of the Ribola, we know that the father of the Ribola, uh, a grape, because grapes have a father and a mother, generally speaking, the father is the same as the Chardonnay in France and the same as the Furment in Hungary. 
is the same. Ah, so it comes from the same parent. One the parent. Same father. One the other one not. The other okay. One okay, so we cross yeah. with something else. Let me give an, uh, uh, you know, a, a moment for the, for the people here up on stage, Luciana, Ghislaine, and Heather, to ask questions if they want. If you're not up on stage and you want to be up here, by all means, raise your hand. I will put you up on stage so you can ask some questions to, uh, to Paul here. Um, and it's, it's really interesting book and very exhaustive book about, uh, about this wine region. I really love his, uh, his, his passion about that. Heather, did you have a question? Yes, actually I did. And sorry about before I dropped my phone. No, don't worry about me. it. I, <laughs> mute, I like, muted oh. you. Not a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I really did have a question. I've been trying to, hey, Paul, it's nice to hear from you. Um, I have Hi. watched for your book when you were getting ready to publish it on the um, Bastianich Wine Community on Facebook. I yes. remember you posting it on there. And I wanted to try to find it. I've been searching for Amazon on it, and I just don't know where. Where can I get it in the United States? Okay. Uh, good question. <laughs> Very good one. It should be on Amazon soon, and uh, we did not manage yet, but uh, we will put it on Amazon quite soon. The, the other thing you can do, you just send a ma uh, mail to my email address, you find my email address on my website. So it's Paul Paul Balke. Yes, so and uh, we, we, com. we have the impression that there is a lot, lot of interest in the United States, so I really am active to uh, do a promotion there. Ah, okay. Yes. So are you, are you going to be heading to the States for like a book tour? Yes, I will do some presentations of the book and the area in several places in the United States. It's not all decided yet when and how, uh, but I know already that there is a lot of interest. Fantastic. Yes. Heather, did you have any other questions for, for Paul? No, I, I was very, you know, ever since he started talking about it, I was very eager to read it. So when I saw he was the guest today, I'm like, I'm taking my lunch break from work at this time, so I don't <laughs> well, miss it. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing that. It seems very Heather. rich and I, very exciting because that's my, my whole favorite, of course, well, yeah, as you know, Wayne, that's my favorite wine area. And I'm, the culture of that area and the history of that area are all very intriguing to me. So I think his book will kind of pull all those things together for me. So yeah, you will definitely uh, learn a lot, a lot about this whole area. And what also it will do is it'll also sort of pull you into places like Vipava, which I haven't explored even as much as I would like to. Um, I would love to go and explore that area more. I've been there once or twice, but not enough. Um, and, and I love Istria, one of my favorite wine places in the world. So it will definitely introduce you to that. Um, Maureen, you just came up on stage. Really happy to see you here. Did you have a question for Paul, Maureen? I do. Hi, Wayne. First How you of doing, all, Paul? And, and hello, Paul. Hello. I'm good, thanks. Good, good. Um, I enjoyed a bottle of Bastianich Schiopatino last night, and I'm just wondering what is the can, can I have a little bit of knowledge about this? Is a grape that obviously, actually, Wayne, I discovered with you at Vinitaly in the late nineties cause we're old, but, um, what it's, it's such a rare, you don't, you know, you only find it in this one little pocket. Paul, can you tell me anything about the origins of that grape? Good yes. question. Yeah. Yes. It Paul, is, hit us up with some it is, knowledge. It is also one of the original grapes of this area. Um, the origins of the grape is not all known, uh, like grapes like Chardonnay and Ribola Jolly, there's more known about them, although not always everything. The origins of this grape, uh, we don't know exactly where and how it was uh, created for the first time. But it's very clear that also this grape has its origin in this area. Um, uh, you can find it on many places in the Cordier Orientari, also in Corio, also in uh, Burda, also in the Isonzo area, and also in the Grave area. So it's more in the northern part of the North Adriatic. But here it's quite common. Uh, also, in the oldest uh, documents, I found uh, a lot of Scopettino in uh, Corio, for example. And there it had also a Slovenian name, which is Pokalca. And also that is an indication that the wine was common, because they had their own name in their own language. Um, at this moment, in Corio and Burda, it's not very much present. But there are some producers uh, thinking to replant uh, more of this grape. Well, yeah, obviously the, the big area is, uh, is Prepolto. And the wine itself is a uh, very interesting wine. And, of course, the, the, the most active area with the, the grape is Prepolto. Exactly. It's, it's a sub-region of the Corriorentale region. Prepolto is very special because the grape grows very well there. 
and gives uh, very good results. Mm. I, I found some very good uh, scopitium mines there. Bastianek is one of them. Um, and um, I find it special because it has a very small peppery notes, very delicate uh, aroma without being too uh, invasive. It's, it's, it can be delicate. And the wine is not, uh, has a spe special type of tannin, not rough, just fine. It needs a little bit of aging and it can age very well and become a very fine and uh, wine. I always have called it sort of the Pinot Noir of, of Friuli. Yes. It has well, that sort of delicacy and that sort of light, elegant structure that you don't find in Rifalsco that is a much more burly sort of yes. uh, hard wine. But uh, uh, Wayne, I have a um, surprise for you because the real Pinot Noir from Friuli is another grape. It's not this one. The Pinot Noir, the, pi uh, the, the wine that I would call the Pinot Noir of Friuli. Ah, okay. Yes. So what what is that? Yes. Well, uh, we will talk. We'll about talk it. about that. Yes. So just to finish up, we don't really have much information about sort of the the antique. No, the genetic of origins Scipatina. are are not completely clear. But I think that the wine has its origin uh, origin in this area uh, around Gorizia. Okay. There's no truth to the rumor that it was somehow related to Syrah. Or to, I think there was another grape variety, either maybe Morvedra or something like that. Maybe it was related to. Well, I didn't read that, so no. that would be new for me. Mm. Yeah, I, I thought mm. I, one time when I was researching Scipatino, I yeah. thought I maybe had heard that. So, not really clear. Maureen, I hope that sort of answered your question at least somewhat. It does, and I, I, uh, I'm looking forward to now knowing what the Pinot Noir is because I've always thought it to be the the thing that I love about the grape is that it about the wine is that it is, uh, you know, it's light and delicate and you can have it as an aperitif, but um, if, you know, kind of a bigger aperitif, but it also does amazing things with food. So it's it's just so versatile that I, I we need more Schio Patino love out there. We, but we, now I'm, I'm hooked on this, what's the Pinot Noir? Yeah. I was yeah. just gonna say, Maureen, I'm with you. I wanna know what the Pinot Noir yeah, is, I'm he's, hanging here. He's got us on tinter yeah. hooks. <laughs> first, first of all, I want to say something about Pinot Noir, just to keep the tension alive a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because before arriving in this area, I thought Pinot Noir should remain in Burgundy. And after tasting Pinot Noir in this area, I have changed my mind. I know Burgundy very well. I visited many producers. I know the great Pinot Noirs of Burgundy. Um, there is one thing that I only have learned, and that is you can get some great Pinot Noir from this area in several places. Even in the flat area, uh, north of Pordenone, where I was today before arriving here. Oh, okay. And even in the interior part of Istria. Uh, in fact, the best Pinot Noir of this whole area came from a vineyard about 300 meters high in the interior of Istria. Wow. And that was, the wine was mind-blowing it was fantastic that good <laughs> and it was that good that I, I would like to take that wine to all the wine tasting that i have this year and i will be bl blow away all the other wines it was fantastic it was that good but the can you, can you tell us who it was of course i will do his pleasure uh, it was rosanich who's uh, oh, okay. now in modafoon and the, oh, sure. the the clue uh, the most important point is that he gave the wine time because it was aged 10 years of which, of course, some years in bottle, uh, but it has also a long age before, aging before arriving in bottle. And that was the clue. Because Pinot Noir is a great wine and it's a great variety, because, but it needs time. And not all producers have managed to uh, have realized that this is so important. They should, I think. So wh when are we going to buy some of these bottles, Paul? Uh, you have to contact the winery. <laughs> I want to go with you because you you have a you have an in when so. you're when you are invited. Okay. Yes. I can't wait. Now I'm I'm really curious to try this wine now because yeah, yeah. Pinot. I've always said that you know Pinot Noir is kind of a is kind of a, a sickness for for winemakers, right? I mean, I I know that when I worked uh, at, at Bastianich, you know, even even our winemakers said, oh, you know. There's a little corner of this vineyard. There's a little place over there by the river that would be great for Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, right? Everybody mm. has this idea that you're going to find like gold. You're going to like strike, it's like finding oil. That You're going to find like the perfect place in Friuli yes. to grow Pinot Noir, no? Um, and it's always been um, underwhelming results uh, for that. Uh, most 
often it is. Um, also not in other places in North Italy, also in the region where I live in Piemonte. I, in Piemonte there is Pinot Noir, it's brought in the 19th century. Uh, and to be honest, I have never tasted a real good Pinot Noir in Piemonte. That's also one of the reasons I say it doesn't belong there. Um, uh, now I have changed my mind, but of course it has to do with good winemaking, one, and two, with giving time to the wine. Okay. And now you want to know which is the other one. Yeah, of course. The more okay. we know, the better. Okay, well, um, this is news. Uh, this is a primeur for you, maybe, for somebody. Uh, one of the big discoveries of this area, I did several in very interesting discoveries. There are several very interesting things. And well, like they say in Italy, uh, Kika, you know. Okay, yeah, kick, exactly. Kicks or special things to find yep. all over. Um, These little jewels. Yes, right? little jewels. Yes, a good word. Um, one of them is the grape variety San Sicot from the Quarner area. And the Quarner area is uh, one of the big discoveries of this whole book. It's just a small part. It's just small. Towards the end of the book. Small chapter at the end of the book. Okay. And where is the Quarner area? It is the Quarner is the area around the Quarner Bay. The Quarner okay. Bay starts with the town Rijeka and Opatia in the north. Okay. And goes along both sides. Uh, so the, the mountain uh, part uh, on the east of Istria. Okay. And uh, on the eastern part of the bay, it goes down to the town of Seny and includes all the islands like uh, Kirk and Stress and uh, Marili in Veli Lozin. Okay. So we're and, moving to Croatia. And yeah. so just uh, you need to go to Croatia because this part is only in Croatia and it also includes some part of the mountains. Uh, and it has some very uh, special, very different wine regions which uh, manage to, to preserve their old varieties of old times, which is very interesting. That is very interesting. And um, the, let's speak about the San Sicot. The San Sicot, they say that it was originated in the island of Sushak. The island of Sushak is um, west, uh, the most southwest island of the corner area. It is west of Mari Lozin. Okay. So it is even southern than, more south than the southern point of Istria. It's about 200 hectares and it's only sand. It's one of the rare only islands sand. in the whole wow. Adriatic Sea with only sand. Just like Venice, Venice is, the town of Venice is built on sand, on sand more yeah. or less. Exactly. Um, this island, you can see it on the map, uh, has uh, been totally planted with vineyards in the past when this island was an important port for Venice. Okay. And um, they had probably only this variety. And now um, in the vineyards here are ex extinct. There is almost nothing left. Um, I heard, uh, I was contacted by somebody on LinkedIn who said to me that he is now at this moment starting a new plantation of vineyards on this I island with this same grape variety, San Sicot. Wow. Well, I tasted the wine from vineyards in the area of, uh, of Kirk near the town Verpnik. The town of Vrpnik is one of the, the real wine centers in the North Adriatic, like Cormons, like Cividale. Wow, okay. And uh, Vrpnik is one of them. And also on the eastern part, um, which is part of the Flish area, you can make this long um, line around the mountains. And here is a Flish uh, region like uh, around the town of Novi Vinodolski. Vinodol means wine and hill. It is, uh, the, the, the word says already, they have a lo old wine traditions in this part of Croatia. And here, s recently, some new uh, young producers have started up. And I was, uh, Monday afternoon, I was uh, near um, there. And I tasted such a wonderful sunset called. I knew that the wine was good. And there was a young winery. They are uh, still building up the vineyards. They're still building up the, the building. But they already have... A young lady who is winemaker and who is very competent wow. knows everything to make the the, the 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 great wines, and the first vintage of that wine was very promising. That was a great wine. So Sansicot, yes. So it's S A N S I K O T. Yes. Sansicot. Is it white or red? It's a red wine. It's a red wine. We okay. are talking about Pinot Noir. Okay. Okay. And I think obviously this wine is something between Pinot Noir. And Nebbiolo. Um, I am a bit early because we have to see more results of other wineries. At this moment, there is starting some 
uh, some interest because all, also other wineries uh, have learned that they have something very interesting in their hands. So if you until wanted, recently, if they did not make the best wine out of it. Now is the time to invest. <laughs> if you're, now the time to if invest. If you're looking yes. to get into the wine biz, yes. yeah, maybe. And I say something else. Um, the distance from Corio and from the eastern part of Fiori to Burgundy is maybe 1,000 kilometers or maybe 800. But still, they brought in around 1850, they brought the um, Pinot Noir from Burgundy to this area. The distance from uh, Verbnik to Collio is uh, in direct line, not even 100 kilometers. Really? So why should they not try to get some of these wines in this area? It would be logical, I would say. To bring uh, Sansicot to Friuli? Of course. Wow, very yes. interesting. They already brought the Malvasia and the Ribola Gialla and the Glera and the Vitosca and the, uh, they are all in this area and... We don't know if they have been uh, originating uh, in which place. They are all from the same area. So in cer in certain way, the Sansicot is also from the same area. So it sh should be uh, very easy to introduce. Okay. Um, I think this is a very interesting wine, very promising, and one of the great discoveries to do in this book. Um, well, I'm, I'm really happy that we're recording this because then we can go back and listen to this later and see if you were right, if, if Sansicot really becomes something really very interesting. Mm. I'm really interested. Um, Luciana, have you? do you have a question? You've been up here on stage since basically the beginning. Did you want to jump in here with a question? Did you have a question for Paul? Oh, hello there. Yes. Hi, Luciana. Hi. Hi. How are you guys? Um, Doing great. Istria is one of my darling places, and Wendy knows that. <laughs> I have a thing for this kind of wines and discovering a new wine every time. And I would like to ask you, which wine do you think would be a great start for someone that never tried before? A great wine from where? From Istria? Yeah. So where someone that never had it before should start drinking? Mm. Mm. I have some thoughts on that, but I'll, I'll let Paul, I'll defer to Paul because he's the expert. Well, um, when it goes about white wines, you should start with Malvasia because that's the important white wine from Istria, both from Slovenian and from Croatian Istria. So I think also you should try uh, wines from both, from Slovenian Istria and from Croatian Istria. And I can, of course, I can suggest you a number of producers, the first uh, ones that come to my mind, if you want. Yeah, that's. I think that's what uh, Luciano wanted to know, so. Well, when we go to Slovenian Istria, uh, you can go to the big company Vina Koper, you can to go to Uras Royans, to Steras, to Magnit, to uh, Bordon, to Rajman. Uh, you can go um, to Korenik and Moscon, that's one of the best in my view. It, this is in Istria now. This is now all we've gone Slovenian down into Istria. Oh, this is also and what's because there's a Koronika. No, this the last one is Korenika and ah. Moscon. That's a very famous winery. It's Co from the area of um, Isola uh, in Slovenian Istria. Okay, uh, Korenika when, and Moscon. Yes, when it comes to uh, Croatia, you can go to the most important ones like uh, Matosevic, the Grassi, Koronika, uh, Damjanic, uh, Trapan. Uh, but there are so many. There are a lot, and, yeah. Uh, there, there are Koslovic, uh, Kabola, uh, Perisic. These are the more traditional styles. These are the, uh, there are some orange wines as well. There is well. a fantastic orange wine. You mentioned Ro Roxanich before. Uh, they make a... Uh, Roxanich a, makes... Uh, I, I'm not sure if he makes a pure Malvasia, but he makes fantastic white wines in a light and in a more heavy uh, macerator style. So he is absolutely very fascinating. Um, uh, in a certain way, uh, Trapando is the same, so he's also on macerated wines. And the most uh, famous one is Giorgio Clay. It's a small winery, but very interesting. Which, what's the last Clay. one? Clay. Clay. Ah, okay. Yes. With he a C. C-L-A-I. C-L-L-A-I, yes. Yeah. He's from Croatian Istria, and he makes a fantastic Malvasia mm -hmm. in a macerated style. But very wonderful wine. Okay. So, uh, all right. Maybe what I'll do is... Um, after we're done, we'll write down some of these and then on the Facebook page or on my Instagram page, I will post the name of the, the producers. Yes. So this way can pe people can see how they're, they're maybe written, then I will rather than spelling names. them out, which I hate to do. Yes. Because, uh, uh, I have to apologize because I'm very sure that I forgot some, 
So there are still more that are really good. Well, that was one of the things about your yeah. book that you said that you in your book you don't mention any producers. Yes, why? Uh, yeah, this, this is important. Uh, this book is a very important wine book. And the importance of this book is that it shows the the beauty of this area and it shows the beauty, beauty to the, the whole world. Uh, so in the United States, you can uh, buy this book and you can enjoy it and everywhere. And this region uh, is very big. Putting list of producers in this book would not bring very much. Because nowadays, today, everybody finds a producer with internet or you buy some uh, wine guide like Gambaro Rosso or Veronelli or Slow Wine. Those are the means to find an individual producer. So I should not add producers in this book because it's not that type of guide. This book is intended because I want that the world learns that this is one of the great wine territories of our planet. This is one of the, the great wine regions, like Bordeaux, like Burgundy, like Tuscany and Piemont. This one is in that row. Yeah, so nothing to be ashamed of when talking about any other wine region in the world. Of course. Fantastic. It's, uh, this, and this region is fascinating, very interesting. For a number of reasons, we did not speak about everything yet. Right. <laughs> yet. Yet, I like that. Um, so, and maybe some some red wines from the Istrian Peninsula. Obviously, Teran or Terano Ter are the are the, the is the big one. Yes, uh, Teran is um, um, an important wine uh, from Croatian Istria. Uh, and is it related to the Terano? From yes, of course. Uh, and Rifolsko. Terano and Rifolsko are of the same families. Okay. Uh, Teran has a higher acidity mm. and really needs to be treated well by the winery. Uh, it is a bit strange, especially in the cars. People drink very young Terran and with high acidity and a very aggressive tannin. And they like acidity, it. Yeah. Um, it's kind of an acquired taste because I would not recommend to bring, drink the wine in that way. And I've seen that people who are not from that region, who are not born there, they don't like that style. Um, but uh, it does not mean that the wine is not interesting. It, it can be very interesting, but it needs time. To age. And there are some wineries uh, that age the wine well, and then you can have very interesting stuff. Ah, who, who would they be? Because I've never tasted an well, aged Well, let Terran. me take uh, one example of a very old Terran. That's the Grand Terran of Coronica. In, ah, uh, okay. In yes, Umag. I've had that. Really, uh, that's a, really that's good. That's a good wine. Very, very good. good. Wine. Yeah. Um, in uh, Slovenia, you have um, Rifosk, which is uh, more or less the Rifosco del Pernuclo Rosso. And this uh, is the most important wine, actually, from Slovenian Istria, because there it is more dominant than the white wine. Ah, which really? Is, which is uh, particular which is because we have the idea Istria is white wine. Well, it's not completely true. Especially the Slovenian part, they have a lot of uh, good red wine. And they are right, because the territory can give great wines. Uh, and I still think um, when you see the soil, when you see the climate and the particular capacities of that terrain, the Slovenian part of Istria is one of the promising territories of this uh, region. And it's very interesting to notice is one of the big producers of Friuli has now invested and is making wine on seven hectares in this area. Ah, this is near Koper, near, uh, uh, near Capo, Koper, yes. Capo Istria. And the winery is Livio Feluga. Oh, really? Yes. I did not know that. Yes. That's a very big. Well, they have their family roots in, in that area. Istria, right? Yes. In that area around Koper. Yes. Oh, okay. So that there's a there's a historical reason for them going Maybe, back there. Uh, yeah. I would say the quality of the wine um, that you can have from that territory can be very interesting. It's kind of uh, Colio or Burda at, at sea, because Colio and Burda definitely they have also sea influence because they're not far from the sea. You can see it on the map. But this area is right at the sea. So um, I think that really um, some far-sighted, very talented winemakers should come there and and see what is the best, the best wines to make in the best territories yes. and things like that. You right? know, I make a lot of uh, talk with producers. I'm talking everywhere around with producers in Colio, in Burda, in Colio Rintani, in Istria, in the Quarne, in Graaf, in Aquileia. You know what I say to them? Uh, sirs, I have a small challenge for you. Nice. Okay. And I say, and I ask them, what is to you the most beautiful wine that you can have in your glass from this area in the future? And they look at me and they say, with big eyes, and they had never heard that question because maybe they never thought about it. 
And that's a very important thing in my my opinion, because in some ways this area, the, the whole area of Friuli, the whole area of Slovenia, Primorska, and uh, Istria and Kvarna, the whole area, in, there are ways to produce even better wines for, for the future. But what is my idea of a better wine? My idea of a better wine is a wine that is not monovarietal. Ah, I like this. And this is very important because um, in certain way, um, producers all over Italy, all over Slovenia, Croatia, but also Switzerland and Germany in the last 50 or 70 or 80 or 90 years have concentrated on mono varietal wines and now they say it's tradition. So in certain ways it's also true. And the second thing is in many places you get fantastic wines mm. like uh, uh, in Barolo, in Piemonte, okay. or in t uh, in uh, Tuscany with Brunello, or in uh, Campania with uh, the Taurasi, which is one of the great wines of Italy. Of course. But there are places in Italy, there are many places that are outside these three top zones, where, to my view, the best wine will never be a mono varietal. Oh, Chianti comes to mind right away. Uh, there, uh, there is something to say about this uh, scene. Until 100 years ago, every wine yard everywhere in Europe had five or ten different grape varieties. And but they only made two wines, one red and one white, more or less. That was <laughs> wine in the past, and sometimes they even made only wine because they mixed everything. Mixed everything. But um, uh, what we do now is more monovarietal, and we, we think that it's the best. We, we should question this, because um, look at France, look at Portugal and Spain. In many areas, they have the culture of still going to find what is the best of a combination of grapes. When a group of young winemakers in, in Bordeaux or in the Languedoc or in Bandol, uh, they, when they come for fun uh, together on Friday evening or Saturday evening, each of the young winemakers, they have made a new blend of their own grapes. They have a blend of Syrah, uh, Mourvedre, uh, Carignan and, and uh, Grenache or they make something else, and uh, they can also make, make every week a new blend, and everyone is doing something, and they say, hey, okay, I make this one, and you make that one, and, and they compare. And so, in this way, they learn about how to, to create the best out of the varieties that they have. And it is very interesting, mm. because in this way, you can uh, create fantastic wines that offer more complexity, more longevity, and that in the end uh, offer also something of the terroir. I've been discussing this with some producers and someone said, no, that will be a vineyard uh, uh, or um, company style. But if you if this is well made... What, what kind of style? Company, company style because the, the wines will be individual because every wine, winery is making something different. Oh, okay. Well, then I say, is it a problem if something somebody makes a great piece of art... And it's beautiful. The only thing is a bit different from from another <laughs> piece of art. Yeah, I don't think it's a problem. Um, and if the other piece of art is different from that one, is that a problem? I don't think it is a problem. I think here the beautiful thing of Italy is that Italian people are very fascinating people, very humoristic, but also very creative. They have a huge fantasy, and they have uh, something artistical. And I have always learned uh, an artist. You should give a bit of space, a bit of freedom to do what he wants. I like that. And um, uh, so give the Italian producers a little space. You see, in Tuscany for many years, they made the super Tuscans. Well, some of them, they uh, made it with uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, Merlot, etc. Uh, it, it can be, but you can also think, why should a Merlot, a pure Merlot, be one of the most expensive wines of Italy? Is that correct? I... I'm not sure. I think this is a great challenge to all wine producers everywhere in Italy to make something that is challenging the wine that has now made as Merlot and seen by many people as the, as the best wine of Italy. Massetto. You know. Yeah. Uh, I think Italy has so many fantastic grape varieties and so many possibilities. There should be something out there that can be more fascinating, more interesting. Uh, I I'm already very sure that I prefer many Barolos above Massetto. That's my taste, and also many uh, Alianicos from Taurasi. Um, and also in the, this area, um, the best wine for the future is not yet made, but I think it's a blend of some 
Ribola and Friolano because they form a contrast. Ribola has high acidity, Friolano has high profile of aroma, which is fantastic together. And then the intelligence of and the artistic thing of the producer to make a combination with, well, somebody will say Chardonnay, the other say, no, it's not okay, you have to do only uh, Malvasia. authentic <laughs> yeah, exactly. Malvasia. Um, well, the discussion about authentic, etc., is very difficult because in the end, every grape variety has always been brought somewhere. From somewhere, yeah. So it's very difficult. Um, I would I would say that uh, here, um, a, a, a bit of space of, of that we give to the artist, you should also give to the producer to make his best. Also, you have to know that producers have everywhere their own situation. Every producer has his own set of vineyards. Uh, there is a, vineyard, uh, a set of vineyards where he has his 70-year-old Chardonnay wine that he wants to use for his blend. So don't say that he should not use it because then he make he cannot make his best wine. Uh, so I I am not too much in favor of limiting too much this. Mm. Would you agree that there are some grape varieties that deserve to be made mono varietal and other grape varieties that are better off being blended? Yes, there are grape varieties that can go uh, alone. Uh, so, but uh, I have also had surprises. There are sometimes producers that really manage to make fantastic wine of a grape variety that I did not expect to be alone. Um, a, a variety that I think is very suited for uh, blended is uh, Ribola Jala. Totally Why? Agree. Be because totally agree. it has a fantastic structure. It has a lot of glycerin and body and is it's strong. It has not a high aroma profile, but it's still, that's no problem because that will be given by the other grapes. But the acidity makes the wine lively and keeps the wine uh, okay for a long period. And that's very important for a, for a wine of high quality. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And the same is for... Well, Wayne, I have a question. Sure, go ahead, Maureen. So, um, Paul, I'm curious to know your, your thoughts on this. I mean, I, I, um, I totally get the, you know, let the chef have as many spices as possible. Do you think that it is more based on the varietal itself that lends itself to being a mono varietal wine, or do you think it's the combination of um, of the varietal and where it's from? I mean, it seems to me that a lot of the mono varietal uh, wines in the old world, especially, come from very specific pockets on very specific soil, and that's been figured out over a really long period of time. So, you know, kind of like the nature nurture is it is it the terroir or is it the varietal? Um. It both. Um, in this case, in this case of the eastern part of Friuli, uh, the, the the specificity of the soil and the character of the soil will come uh, through after three or four years in every wine. So even if you make a mono varietal or a blend, it will always come through. And that's very specific for this territory. I feel that it is more specific in this case than in other cases. Um, I, as I said before, um, there are some. Wines like Barolo of Tor or Taurasi that are, in my view, some of the greatest wines of, of the whole world, not only of Italy, and that are mono varietal. And um, in such area, I would say the best wine is really mono varietal because it's uh, a fantastic blend of terroir, of, of the, the, the area, and the soil, climate and everything, and the, the grape variety. That goes for uh, Nebbiolo with Barolo and Arianico with Taurasi. In other places, I would say uh, it is very often uh, the best option, and I uh, I count uh, there also Corio in uh, to to think about uh, the best blend, and I really think that in Corio the best wine is a blend. In Corio, the best wine is a blend. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But by nature of the, and I think uh, correct me, Maureen, if I'm if I'm 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 quoting you correctly. So if Colio is the best area for a blend. Is it because of the terroir or is it because of the grapes? No, it's not that. that uh, it's 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 not that Colio is the best area uh, uh, as a blend. Uh, Colio can give great wines as Chardonnay or uh, Pinot Grigio or Ribola Gialla or uh, Sauvignon. Okay. Uh, and uh, Malvasia also. I, I love some Malvasias and some Friolanos from Colio. I really enjoy them. They are among my best wines from Italy. Um, so don't misunderstand me uh, because it's a great terroir. The same is from uh, Burda, which is also a great terroir. But I say uh, still, 
Uh, and I do have very vivid discussion with producers at this moment, because not everybody agrees with this. Uh, I still think that even then, the best of Corleo will be still uh, a blend. Blend yeah. of wine. Okay. I, I, I actually do agree with you. I know that when I came here to Free Willy 20 years ago, um, the most important wines were all blended wines. You know, the most famous wines were Terre Alte and Vintage yeah. Tunina and Breg and Capo yeah. Martino and yeah, I, I can name other ones that that, that there were. So, and that's the way it was twenty years ago. That was Friuli and great Friuli. Everybody made their mono varietal yeah. wines, but the the best wines were always blends. But then they became, I guess, difficult to to market and and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, when I think of that, and now this this sort of spreading out of mono varietal wines, especially mm. with the rise of Ribola Jala as being sort of almost kind of the flag yeah. bearer of Friuli right now. Uh, I, I, I very much agree with you that it, it's it's much better when it's used um, in a blend. In yeah, a blend. well, um, uh, there is also something uh, to say about uh, g uh, the the politics and grape varieties, because it's very mm -hmm. strange to hear that politics in Friuli, but also in Veneto, but also in Puglia, and even on national level in Italy, uh, have been um, involved in defending uh, a grape variety. And I think this is not really the the right thing to do. And um, in Europe, we follow the French concept, and I think that's correct, because the the real concept of protecting a wine and creating a denomination is creating a denomination on on basis of the geography. So if you have a wine region which is called Merceau, the wine that comes from this area is called Merceau. By chance, in this case, it's Chardonnay, but nobody puts Chardonnay on the label. No. Um, I think Friuli should better think, and every, everywhere in Italy, is, uh, in fact, Barolo is a great example, Torage is a great uh, example, Brunello is also an example, even if they use the name of the grape, but still it is a good example. Uh, because the, 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 the area should be uh, dominant in uh, putting the wine and promoting the wine. And not the grape variety, because uh, you you cannot have a politician from here or there that says uh, they are not allowed to put this grape variety there or there. No, it's it. Uh, grape varieties have always been traveling. Uh, the grape variety that is most uh, one of the most used in the world is Chardonnay. It was created in a monastery in Burgundy in 1500. And now it has traveled all over the world. But the French uh, have right to say that it has their origin in France. And I heard nobody in France saying that it's not allowed to put Chardonnay on the label everywhere in the world. Uh, that would be the logic if you find the logic here. Yeah. And it's not correct. It's not correct. Yeah. So you, you need to concentrate on a regional name for a wine. And this makes sure that even if you put that grape variety in another place, the name of the region is only specific to that place. Yes, you, and that wine is that region. Of course, you can add the grape variety uh, to the name. You have some examples in Italy. Uh, Brunello di Montalcino is one. Barbera okay. de Asti is another one. Okay. So you can uh, have Ribola di Grave, for example. And that okay. would be uh, very different from Ribola di Colio. Uh, Corio uh, Ribola because so, or uh, Ribola di Bologna two, or <laughs> yes, Ribola because there are two different uh, uh, um, uh, wine regions and they have their uh, own geography so it, it makes directly clear that you have a wine from that area and that should be the way it is okay very uh, really interesting I, I really like that Luciana looks like you have a question Maureen I wanted to make sure that you're satisfied with that uh, with that answer Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely loving this. Thank you guys both. Cool. Thank you, Maureen. Luciana, did you have a so, question? Yes. I, 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 I was about to ask about the most underrated wine he thinks um, is there. But uh, my question would be, is blended wine, is, is the blended wine, not monovarietal, the most underrated one? Well, I would say no, because uh, as uh, Wayne already said before, uh, blended wines, uh, if made well, uh, are already having high status. In fact, when you go around in Corio and Corio Rentari, many wineries will present their blend as last wine in the tasting, yep. and it's also the most uh, expensive. The only thing uh, th uh, is that even uh, by the order of the tasting, you will see this the most, pre most pre prestigious wine, and maybe you, you cannot say best wine, but most prestigious wine is more easy to say. 
Um, but still, uh, the, the category of these wines do not get much attention. And I would create, like to create more attention and also the right attention to this category. Yeah, I, I totally agree. But I think the, the biggest stumbling block for those types of wines is just, you know, so much of, of marketing is, is uh, drawn to putting a grape variety on the label. Uh, and then this way, when you walk into a supermarket, well, you might not recognize the producer, but you're going to recognize the grape variety. Oh, Merlot. I like Merlot. Yeah. I've never seen that label before, but look, it says Merlot. Okay, I'll buy yeah. that. Yeah. Or Chardonnay or Cabernet or whatever it may be. So I think that's kind of why, especially a market as powerful as the United States, uh, tends to push really hard towards monovarietal wines. Yeah. And I know in my experience... Um, and also speaking to winemakers, they're always super proud of their blends, but they always find them the most difficult to sell because yeah. they can't they can't sell themselves on the shelf. They have to be hand sold. They have to you know they need a big shelf talker explaining yeah. what they are. So uh, the, the the best way to sell them is when you have a tasting because uh, the people buy the wines after taste, and you will see that after tasting they buy that wine, the wine that they are most happy with. The only thing is, in a supermarket or in other situations, there is no testing moment. And there it goes only on what's on the label. So that is uh, another point that you made, Wayne, uh, because I think there's really a time and moment that we maybe should start to rethink the policy of the labels. Uh, first of all, because um, we cannot expect that uh, consumers know everything about wine, because uh, not everybody of the 500 million Europeans can know everything. We cannot expect that. But of the point course. is that at this moment, uh, the consequences are quite hard. The consequences is that some very good wines is not, are not made. The consequence is also that some people, uh, by not knowing, they buy something that is really not the best wine, only because they have some label which has uh, some certain name. So we should really think about what, how can we create a better system of um, uh, labeling that will lead the supermarket guy who is wandering through all those lines of wines to the wine that he will like better. And that's a very in uh, interesting discussion. I think it's not easy. We cannot finish that discussion today. No, of course, but but I think that would be the it's the line. A good direction, yeah, yeah, the right direction to go. And uh, maybe in the end, uh, I make a very strong statement. Maybe we should forbid to put Merlot and Chardonnay on the label. Why not? Mm -hmm. I will be for that. Yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, say yeah. As long as you, I think the the, the concentration is on the place rather than on yeah. the grape. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I wanted to get back to Luciana's other question is, are there underrated grape varieties here that you would recommend, things that don't get enough attention? Um, yes, I think there are. Um, it, it, it depends where you are because uh, there are some underrated varieties in Friuli that maybe people in Friuli know, but not in the Netherlands. And maybe that counts even for most wines of Friuli. For example? Because, uh, Malvasia from Friuli... I don't think you find much in uh, in the Netherlands, and I find many of the Malvasias that I drink in Friuli, both from Corio, from Corio Orientari, but also from Aquilaia. So fascinating, good wines. Okay. Yes. So Malvasia, you think is underrated? I would totally agree with that. How yes. about any and some something underrated, maybe from? Well, no, uh, no I'm. I think. Everything from Vipava is underrated yes, <laughs> because uh, nobody knows anything about it. It's one uh, of my favorite the whole, areas. The whole region of Vipava is underrated. Uh, there's also a region where the producers themselves are underwriting everything. That's the region we just talked about. Um, and um, another grape is the Friulano. Why okay. I am saying this? Because Friulano is a wine that has uh, specific characteristics. It's like Cinderella. It's like um, a beautiful lady that was uh, stayed, staying at home, not treated well, uh, then uh, gone some, somewhere else, uh, uh, went to the, uh, the dancing place and um, won the heart of the prince and became princess. Okay. And uh, Friulano is like that. I like that. And um, uh, Friulano is um, a grape that uh, in Bordeaux, where it's, it's from, is considered by all wineries as something minor. 
don't put interest in Sauvignon Nass because that's the real name. So because no, it's not an interesting grape. That's what they say. And here in Friuli, in the eastern part of Friuli and in the western part of Slovenia, a little bit Berda and Vipava, you can have so wonderful wines of this grape. The same is interesting, is happening now in Chile, because it was not discovered until 10 years ago. And now they are discovering that they had uh, much more Sauvignon Nass than they knew. And now... Because they uh, thought it was Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, yes, uh, it was... Or uh, Chardonnay, something like that. It was put, put together with Sauvignon Blanc and mm. there was no intention. Now it gets a lot of attention and soon it will be the other region where you have a lot of uh, Sauvignon Nass. There it is called with the real name Sauvignon Nass because the real name, we don't have to forget that the real name of Friulano is Sauvignon Nass. Okay. Which is not related to Sauvignon Blanc. It's in the far, uh, far away distant, related, but it is related. a different grape. Okay. So, and, and what about some other grape varieties that are not Friulano grape varieties? Maybe something from Vipava or something from, from Istria? Because um, Istria, I only know Malvasia and, and Tehran. In Istria, you have um, an interesting grape variety. It's called uh, Malo Cern, or in Italian, it's called Negra Tenera. They still have a lot of it in the in the Slovenian part, but in Croatia at Klai, you can find a fantastic, very delicate, wonderful, light, sparkling wine. Try wow. the Malo Churn or the Negra Tenera of Klai, and you have a wonderful wow. wine for your aperitivo. Fantastic. One of the best. Fantastic. Because it is quite neutral, has a very high acidity, and is very suited for sparkling. And, um, well, it's a wine of this area. Okay. Interesting, very interesting. Well, let's. We're talking about blends, right? We're we're talking about this whole sort of political idea of blends. But you actually make a blended wine. Well, I don't. Which we're drinking right now. You, no, we cannot say that. I'm making it. I am the intellectual father of this wine, <laughs> and that's okay. all. Okay. Uh, okay. On, well, on the label, we put it quite correctly because uh, we say on the label this wine has been uh, produced according to the concept and the idea of Paul Balken. But it is not okay. produced by me. Okay, so you're just sort of so, the... So you find the correct name of the producer, which is Sibau in, uh, okay. in the, Kori, uh, uh, the Slovenian Corio. And the front label is, is your, it is, your profile. It's my profile. Okay, it looks just like you. Yeah, I can see. I'm, I'm taking a picture right now as we speak. So. It's very simple. Um, so what this is? So this is from from uh, from Burda. Uh, yes. So this is from the Slovenian side. Yes, it is very close to Corio. Um, the vineyards are in a direct line, one kilometer from the border with Italy. Okay. On a very old flesh soils near Nebro, um, and the, the family who is producing is a wonderful family. They have their their hearts in their wine, and they are living there for six or seven generations already. All in the same house. What's the name? The name of the family is Shibau. Shibau. Shibau in Nablon, in uh, Goriska Burda. And um, uh, I wanted to have this wine because I wanted to have a blend that is made as an elegant style. So I didn't want a uh, uh, wine with too high alcohol, but I didn't. Uh, I wanted elegance and finesse, uh, which, which yes, finesse, fi fineness. You can say it like that in English. Yeah, but right? finesse is, is also yeah. an English word. And, yeah. um, and I would like also that the, the terroir, so the specific character of the territory is coming soon. And I think with this wine, we achieve this, uh, this goal because the wine is really fine. Mm. And uh, the funny thing is, it's a white wine from 2015. And some people would not even wow. start drinking it because exactly. it's too old. Well, you, now you're tasting the wine. And you can it's, see it's, it's fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a uh, it's a very normal convention, conventional wine making. Mm. So only the Ribola in this has macerated some hours, but not too much. And um, uh, the wine, winery uh, works conventional, but works really very very um, very organic. I would say because they don't uh, spray on their wines when it's not necessary. They are very careful because it's their family since many generations. Wow. They're really careful with that, their own soil. So, um, in fact, the wine is almost biological because they are limited also with uh, the use of uh, silver and, and copper. Um, the wine is of 50 uh, Sauvignon Nass, 30 Ribola Gialla, 15 Pinot Blanc, and 5 Pinot Gris. Wow, okay. And uh, why? Why this? Because we have made a lot of proofs 
and model of tasting, and in the end, the most harmonious wine for our understanding was this blend in this way. I do agree that it's very harmonious. You have the yes. right levels of everything. You have the right levels of, of acidity and fruit, and it's very fresh. But that very typical sort of Friulian um, sapidity, sal saline quality comes <coughs> out. So, yeah, it's, it's very, very nice. And this is all done in stainless steel? Stainless steel and a little bit of um, cement and old, uh, okay. old uh, oak, uh, not no, old, very used oak uh, barrels. And uh, the wine is uh, now two and a half years in the bottle and it's really developed in a very interesting way. In the beginning, it was, um, they call it snello, it was a bit meager. Okay, a little bit shy. Um, little it was thin. a bit shy, yes. Um, it was not really strong, and some people said mm, the wine is not too interesting. But then it started to open, and the funny thing is, uh, it's now even a bit cool. Yeah, it is. you have to notice that it will uh, open up and it's warmer. Right. So, very, very interesting. Yeah. I'm, so, is this the only vintage of, of this wine that you Until made? Now, or are, you, yes. are you planning on making some more? <coughs> I'm planning uh, more, but I want to make also something in South Italy. I already make something in Piemonte. Which is okay. A, a yeah, you have a red wine that you make from Piemonte, yeah, right? With the same label. It is, yes, and it's really fantastic. It's really very, very, very special. And is this also a blend? It, of course. Of course. Uh, you know, how is Piemonte? I know Piemonte very well. I lived there 12 years. I am driving around there uh, for more than 20, 21 years. Wow. So I know Barolo very well. Barbaresco, Monferrato, I, Rauero, I know them. I, I love them because Piemonte is fantastic. But Piemonte is also very much on the mono varietal. Absolutely. Um, when you have Barolo, I want to say nothing. I want to be very clear. Barolo is my preferred red wine. There is no other wine in the world that I prefer above Barolo. You can you can put on the table the, the best and the most expensive Baro, uh, Bordeaux or anything, and I prefer Barolo. Okay. I want to be clear about it. But Piemont is more than only Barolo. So, when we go to Montferrato, which I know very well, it's a fantastic area of many hundreds of small towns. <coughs> and um, there you find so many old traditions and indigenous varieties, like the Freysa, which was in the past a very important variety. Absolutely. I wrote an article which you find on my website. Freysa is a strong uh, red wine, which is very directly related to Nebbiolo and also to Vignonier. It's something between. It, they are not sure which one is older, Freysa or Nebbiolo. They think that they are both very old varieties in Piemonte that uh, exist at least 1,000 or 1,500 years in the territory. So uh, Nebbiolo, Barbera and Freise are uh, all three the most old varieties from the territory of Piemonte. Um, and they have close genetic relations. Um, the wine is 40% Nebbiolo, 30% Freise, 25% Barbera and 5% Croatina. Wow. So no... Cap, no Cabernet Sauvignon, no Merlot, no international grape varieties. Of course not. Only Piemonte, because I want to show that you can have a wonderful wine this way. And the wine is wonderful. I think, I think I've think i tasted it, yes. No, you have not. I have not tasted no, it. I thought you gave me a bottle a couple no, of years yes, ago. No, yes, well, uh, that was the old version. You That's should taste this The new version. version. Okay. 2017 is really getting fantastic now. It's still young, but it has very fine tannins, so it's, it needs still a little bit of aging. Nice. But the wine is developing wonderful. The producer himself, who did this uh, uh, as a favor to me, because he he does not need this, he is an important producer in Barbaresco, in Piemonte. He said, Paul, I'm, at the, at the start of it, he said, Paul, I'm doing it for you because I like you, but I'm not really sure if it's a good idea. <laughs> now he has changed opinion. He said, this is wonderful. because he, When I am coming out of wine. Now he now, wants to do it. Yes, well, <laughs> I know uh, what he's doing. The wine has developed so well that he has totally uh, uh, changed the idea. So he's... He's, he's convinced. He's con yeah. You yeah. convinced him, you changed yes. his mind with, this, the, with this, this wine. wine. The funny thing is, he says uh, to me, Paul, that's your wine. And I said, I'm sorry, Matt, it's your wine, you made it. <laughs> 
But he you just, says, you just yes, put it but together. Without you, I would never have made it. Okay. He would have never thought to. So um, we're hitting about the hour and a half mark here. So I do want, I know we started late, but I do want to talk, um, I want to finish up by talking about um, what's going on. I know that you, you're working on always a million different projects. You're always all over. So you've been working on a project in the Balkans. I remember that you did something down there. You're also working in Campania. Tell us a little bit about what you're working on now. Well, um, uh, most of all, I'm, uh, I'm starting a project to create more visibility for this territory in the United States. Uh, because We need I, it. We need it, definitely. I, I, I think that this territory has a lot to offer. It's absolutely wonderful. The more now I'm uh, going around to finishing it, you have made a book, but I'm still every day learning more about the region by talking with people and discussing things. Uh, and uh, I'm falling even more in love with this region. But I think really we should communicate the area. And I hope to put together the important producers and the important institutions to create visibility because this area has a lot to win. Uh, we should draw the, the American tourists that, that come, the tourists that come to Europe, they should come here and taste their first wines here. I agree. <coughs> Before they go to Venice or Tuscany. And uh, I think there's a lot of potential of having more of the wines of Friuli, uh, uh, Littoral, Slovenia, Istrian Quarter on the market in, in the United States. We should work on that. I totally think we should work. That. Yeah. I totally, and I, and I, I'm, I hope we can somehow work together and 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 help to yes, promote should. more of that because I, I I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, just having spoken to some some people before, I know that. Uh, you know, one of the big trends in uh, tourism now is that there's a movement away from the big tourist centers. So away from Tuscany, away from Venice, away from Rome. I mean, first time travelers tend to want to hit like the big notes, right? So they go yes. to Venice, they go to Florence, they go to Rome. Yeah. But almost definitely after that, or for sure the third time, they're looking for the undiscovered gems, right? Yes. The Kike. Yes. So, and and Friuli, I think, in this area of the northern Adriatic has a huge amount of potential for being yeah. Yeah. one of those cool places that you don't understand until you actually get there. So once we start bringing people in, um, I think they'll start to understand how amazing this place is. You're showing yes. me a picture in the book now. <coughs> yes, Ben, uh, you know this place. This is uh, near the border between Corio and, uh, and Burda. Okay. This tower, it's on page now. I don't know which tower, which place in the book. It um, shows one of the watchtowers of the Yugoslavia army. Okay. It's, it is now on a place which is very peaceful. Um, but when you go to there... Uh, the vineyards and the wineries around there, in both in Slovenia and in Italy, at this place, there are some of the most famous wineries. In Italy, you have uh, Renato Kaber, Edi Kaber, uh, Koleduga, uh, Blasic. In Slovenia, you have Marian Simcic, Movia, Sturek. They are all so all together. All right around there, yeah. yes. Very famous names. And there in the middle is standing this watchtower. And... Uh, when you are at the winery, uh, at one, the balcony, tasting wine, at the one, you see it. And then they have to tell you that once it was not so peaceful because in that tower were soldiers surveying the area and watching that nobody is crossing the border. And uh, in that time with Yugoslavia, the, the soldiers from Yugoslavia normally were from Serbia, Macedonia, and there was tension. And now uh, there's no tension. It's so peaceful. And now um, uh, I only say this story has to be told because this is fascinating. This was maybe a part of the Iron Curtain of Europe. Yeah, of course. And now it's one of the most peaceful parts of Europe. And I think many American people want to come here and to see this. I think it would be, yeah, I think it's very interesting. Um, let's sort of start wrapping up. One question that just came to mind talking about this, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up the room here. Um, it, there's talk about molding, melding Burda and Colio together into one international wine region. Do you think that that's going to happen? Do you think that's a good idea? Um, it's not up to me uh, to, to decide on this. <coughs> when I speak with producing Colio, uh, I hear very different uh, thoughts. Um, 
uh, one thing that I can understand very well about Corio is that Corio has been one of the most important brands for white wine in Italy for a long time. And they want to protect their brand because that brand is very valued. Yeah. And that is something, well, let's talk about business. That's uh, protecting their business. And I can understand that. But the situation of Corio is very specific because in the case, in this case of Corio, this border was created in 1947 a bit by chance, a bit by a pencil made by someone somewhere. And um, it's also a very strange border. When you go through the hills, you will see that it's very strange. Um, in the 70 years of Yugoslavia, uh, uh, or 60 years, the producers in the Slovenian part were looking at their people. Some were friends, some were even relatives or family. In the Italian port, they, they could develop and make big wineries and develop because it was the post-war period and they could develop and they, they became very important wineries. And it's logical that they want to uh, develop themselves now. They Now they have the freedom to do it and uh, who can deny that they want to do the same thing? Right. So I can understand that. Um, uh, at the same thing, also many people say it would be also nice to create a united territory. And uh, that would require uh, cross-border de denomination. Uh, there, uh, there are several the opinions about it, but there is one thing: it is possible by European law. So, uh, by law, there should not be an obstacle. Uh, the only thing is that the lawyers of the both countries should come together and uh, make some some uh, agreements about how to unite unite the law systems of the both areas. That's quite complicated, but that's that's a legal matter. So they can make a commission of legal um, uh, experts of both countries. They can put them together and they can do that. That's something specific, okay. and uh, it does not matter to to go to the table on Saturday afternoon and say it's not possible, it's too complex, because sometimes complex uh, problems can be arranged. You only need some experts. The more, more difficult thing is if people really want it. The point is that this was a border between two state systems, and in the past, the, the history of this territory was very complicated. And there are still people who have some emotions about things in the past that were we maybe very complicated and difficult because the past for some families and for some persons has been very hard. We should understand that. And I think that is uh, maybe the reason that uh, uniting this area will need some time because uh, maybe we need another generation who will... Uh, have less the burden of the past on the shoulders and will be more free to make decisions about how to, to make the future. Uh, but I also can say that I speak with a lot of people and there are a lot of people already now on both parts of the borders that are uh, telling to me that they are really willing um, to do to, this. To, to put them together. And uh, apart from a legal system and a legal uh, or like a legal solution, I would say um, it's always a good idea to do already projects together, to go to the United States together and tell the story. Because even if they don't change the denomination and they st still keep uh, Slovenian wine and Italian wine, um, there's no problem of doing already some promotion together. Why not? They can go Why both not? to the United sure. States and... Pre and, and explain the border. They can take the photo of the Yugoslavia Tower <laughs> exactly. and put it there and explain. And explain this. The and it, this. it's an interesting story. So the point is that I think uh, this this territory is a great wine territory. It's one of the jewels on, uh, of the elite regions of the wine world international. And that has to be uh, understood by the wine world. And that counts for both the Italian and the Slovenian part equally. Okay. And uh, it's important that the wine learn, world learns that. I think the wine world is very interested. I think also that it would be uh, a sign of greatness if the people in Corio and Berda would have the, the, the greatness to understand that when they do something together, they will be creating something new that is even more important than the brand Corio right now. That would be the great thing. Mm, that's great. I love ending on an up note. That's a very positive uh, vision of, of the future in in, uh, in Friuli. So um, last call for anybody who has any more comments or any uh, more questions for, for Paul or anything. If, if you're not up on stage, jump up now. Now is it's now or never, guys. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, I'm just going to say thank you very much, Paul. We, there's so much more that we could talk about. We could go on for another hour for sure. 
Um, cause I still have a couple of questions, but, uh, we've been going for an hour and a half, so I do want to wrap it up. Um, so thank you very much for Paul for spending some time with us tonight. Thank you to everybody who's who spent the time here, Heather and Luciana and Maureen, who've spent a lot of time up here. Maureen, I see that you're off mute. Did you want to say something? I did. I just wanted to thank both of you guys. This has been absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much. Thank you, Maureen. That thank means you. a thank lot you. coming from yes. you. And I'm, I'm not being facetious about that. I, I mean that very honestly. So thank you. I appreciate that. I, I do think it's really funny that I had a bastion at Skio Patino last night. Like, I must have vibed this. So there you thank go. you both. It's thank kismet. You. There you go. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Heather. Did you have something that you wanted to add? I just wanted to also add thank you. It was very enjoyable to listen, and I learned a lot, and I can't wait to get the book. Grab the book. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Paulbalke.com, right? Yes. Dot com. Yes, you'll find it's, me there and send me a mail. Yep, and there's yes. there's lots of other resources there about your wines yes. and about all that sort of stuff. So yes. good uh, good thing. Luciana, thanks for coming. Everybody who's down there. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, yeah, Paul, thank you for bringing the wine. We're going to finish that up now. I think we're going to have a little bit, a couple of glasses of wine. And um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And we'll um, we will see you very soon. I have in two weeks, I have a guy named Rick. Ricardo, um, who's going to be here talking about um, the Spolert Winery. Um, he had to move back a week, so I got a hole for next week, so I can't promote next week right now. But um, we'll definitely be back next week. Keep an eye on um, the Facebook page and on the Instagram, my personal Instagram page. I will post some of the wineries that uh, Paul mentioned before about being, uh, that Luciana asked about, about being uh, sort of wineries to start with in uh in Istria. Uh, and I'll also post some pictures of your, of your wine in your book there. So yes. definitely jump in on there and, and uh, you can get some visuals on that. So thanks everybody. Um, really great doing this with you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Robbie, as always for being a man. Natalie had to leave early because um, she's got things to do. So thanks everybody for coming tonight and I will see you all next week. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Hey, I want to thank everybody this evening for coming. Thank you for listening. I appreciate uh, Natalie Benlolo, our co-host, Rob Milani, our sound guy. Follow me on La Taverna Friuli on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram at Wayne McGreat. And you can find this awesome music on YouTube at Beat Ambassador. Finishes with an A. Thank you.